And uh, we'll just read Joshua 22, and then I'll preach about, uh, I'll tell you what topic I'm preaching on tonight. Joshua 22. Uh, I don't know how familiar some of you are with this story, but we'll read through the chapter, and then I'll explain, and then this is why I'm preaching on this topic. (laughs) Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, and get you unto your tents, and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side Jordan. So if you don't know what's happening up to this point, maybe it would be easier if I explain it as we read through it, so you don't forget what happened in the story. But um, if you remember when they came out, uh, you know, after they were wandering in the wilderness, right, and they were about to go into the promised land, they had certain kings they had to destroy before they get to the the Jordan River, and then they crossed the Jordan River into the promised land. Um, And then there were certain tribes, which I mentioned here, you got the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the um, half the tribe of Manasseh, right, which are three of the tribes of Israel. Um, If you remember that story, you might not remember, Um, but... Basically, they, after they defeated those kings, they looked at the, the land that was on, this, on the, their side before they crossed over Jordan, and they said, hey, you know, this is like good land here. You know, why, don't, why don't we just inherit this? You know, and then you, know, you guys can inherit what's in the promised land. And then Moses thought, well, you can't just stay here while your brethren go to war, right? So you know, they're like, no, 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 we're just going like, to set up and you know, get everything ready, but we'll still go into war with you, and then once everything's finished, we'll come back and inherit our land on this side of, of the Jordan River. So that's what they're referring to here. So after, this is now at the end of Joshua, right? Where all the, the conquered, you know, all the land, they've divided it up. And now Joshua is saying, hey, you've done everything that Moses commanded you and since that you went to war with your brethren, now you can go back and return the other side of Jordan um, to where you had set up your tents and everything like that. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went unto their tents. Now the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses, had given possession in Bashan, but unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan westward. And when Joshua sent them away also unto their tents, then he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, with silver and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren." And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go unto the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. So that, that's important because this is where there's a bit of a controversy here between uh, in the nation of Israel. So basically they crossed back over. It was very clear from the commandments of God that you know, they were only meant to sacrifice in a certain place where God had told them. And right now, if I go by memory, that the, ta- the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. So they cross over and then on the other side of the Jordan River, they build a big altar on the other side of the river. Right? So that's what they've done here. So he says they, they built an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Right? So this is a really serious issue, right? Because God is saying, hey, you can't sacrifice just anywhere. It's only where I say. Then they see them building this altar. So people hear about them building this altar. And then it all spreads through the nation of Israel. And they're ready to go and fight against them. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief, house of prince throughout all the tribes of Israel and each one was in head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh unto the land of Gilead and they spake with them saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord 
in that you have builded you an altar, that you might rebel this day against the Lord. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it will be, seeing you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. So you can see that they're really upset that they're seeing this altar getting built, and they're coming to the point where they want to fight against their brethren. Did not Achan, and again, they're comparing them to these other sins that Israel had committed, if you, if you know the story as you read through the Bible. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity? Then the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered, and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel. So notice what's happened here. They've seen them do something, right? But keep in mind, they don't know why they've done it. But they've heard them do something. They're assuming now what they're going to do. They've held accusations saying, hey, you're like this, you're like that. They've come with, with arms. They've come to fight, right? Now the children of Reuben are going to explain what they're doing. The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and he does, doesn't he? He knows God is the only one that knows. I think that's something that we have to learn as well then. Um, you know, what I'm preaching about tonight is only God, God only knows somebody's heart, right? It's like we, we think we know people's hearts, but, you know, we can only hear what they say. So they say, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel, he shall know, if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. So he says, God already knows why they do it. But then they say, but Israel is going to know. Why? Because now they're going to explain what they're doing. But all of Israel... They never heard the explanation, right? They jumped to conclusions. And then they went in uh, with guns blazing. That we have built us an altar to turn, say, save us not this day, that we have built an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offerings or meat offerings, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. So he's saying, if we built this altar to actually disobey God and offer sacrifice on it, then the Lord, then he's, they're saying the Lord himself required. He, then God will punish us for that. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. So what are they saying there? They're saying that, why have we built this altar? Because one day in the future, your children might say to our children, hey, God has actually made this river to divide us and you don't have anything to do with the nation of Israel, right? And you don't have anything to do with sacrificing to the Lord in Shiloh, in the tabernacle and whatnot. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. So now we learn what was the intention of them building that altar on the other side of Jordan. Remember, it was Israel. They just sought, they didn't clarify anything. They assumed things. They went in, right, with guns blazing, or on this side, swords drawn, right, ready to battle. And now they've heard the explanation. No, no, we're not building this to actually offer sacrifices, we are building this because you may one day want nothing to do with us and tell our children that we have nothing to do with you. And this is here as a witness and as a pattern of what God had actually told to build and, and what we were to sacrifice on in the right place. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, 
for meat offerings or for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before his tabernacle. And look at this. And when Phineas, the priests and the princes of the congregation and heads of the thousands of Israel, which were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said unto the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad and to the children of Manasseh, this day we perceive that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this trespass against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, and the princes returned from the children of Reuben, from the children of Gad and out of the land of Gilead unto the land of Canaan to the children of Israel and brought them word again. And the thing pleased the children of Israel. And the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them in battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. So what am I preaching on today? T today's topic is going to be misunderstanding and miscommunication. That's what I'm going to be preaching about today. Um, and I think the reason why I've started with this passage here, because you know, I've preached on this passage multiple times in my life, but I just think it's a great example of misunderstanding and miscommunication, right? Because this is, what, this is what happens in our lives, right? When people misunderstand and they miscommunicate. Because what happened in this, remember they saw them do something, they didn't know why. They didn't try to find out why are they doing this. They go to conclusions, they hurl assumptions, they start comparing them with other things that are, are actually wrong and say, oh, you're like this and you're like this. But what, then when they actually went, right, they went ready to fight, not ready to listen, but luckily, in this instance, they did listen to Reubenites, the, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They then understood why they were doing that thing. And what happened? Then, then it was neutralized, right? They realized, oh, this is actually not big. But just think about it, though. But if they had done that first, right, is, is instead of first jumping to conclusions and going in ready to fight, they'd first clarified why they were doing things. Then we could have skipped all the way down to verse 34 and all of Israel would have just been pleased. There, would have, there might not have been this chapter. But then again, you know, if we didn't get this chapter, we couldn't have learned this lesson that it not only happens amongst nations and amongst tribes that miscommunicate, that misunderstand one another, it also happens amongst individuals. Now, why am I preaching on this topic? Because when, when, you, when you talk about a topic like this, you know, miscommunication, bad breakdown of relationships, conflict resolution, people often think, ah, oh, this is a reaction to like a specific scenario. You probably have some scenario in your head right now. You might be thinking, is Victor preaching about me? You know, is that why? So, you know, may, maybe, you know, because unfortunately as a bishop of a church, it's hard to detach yourself fully from things that happen within the church. So I apologize for that. But, you know, maybe, but there are many things. These are just, you know, honestly, I'm not preaching this in reaction to any specific one situation that you're probably thinking of, but it's good if you're thinking of something because then you can apply it in your head, um, what, you, what, what we're going to learn from the scriptures tonight. And like I said, it's pretty hard as a bishop to completely detach yourself from personal issues and issues that the church is involved in or the church knows about or people within the church. And honestly, I try not to make things personal. I know when, when uh, I preach, I hope you guys see that. I'm not, I, when I preach, I'm not trying to take things personal and I hope that you don't take things personal. And honestly, this is like just another example of what I'm talking about, you know, like miscommunication, misunderstanding where people hear preaching and they're like, are you talking about me? You know, but it's like, no, I'm just, I'm just preaching the word. You know, I'm not trying to make it personal, but so sometimes it might sound personal, right? So it's just another example of, you know, just misunderstanding, miscommunication. And misunderstanding and miscommunication, it's just issues that we all deal with in our lives, right? Why? Because we live in a world with people that are sinful and are fallible, and, and that's you too, you know? If you're just thinking, yeah, I do live in a world where other people are sinful and fallible. No, that, the, pro the problem starts with you. Like, you are sinful and fallible too, because we have the power within us to, to try and keep the peace as much as we can to do what's right. So this, um, this sermon's not so much about conflict resolution, right? Because obviously when you have problems, there are certain steps that you take to try and resolve the conflict. What I want to focus more on about uh, today is prevention, right? And we've all heard the saying that, a, that, a, that an ounce of, of prevention is worth a pound of cure, you know, of your metric system, right? A gram of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. And my main reason why I kind of want to talk about this today and why I've been thinking about it is because if you want a church where there is the liberty 
to discuss various topics, then we need to prevent as much of this as possible, right? We need to prevent of as much miscommunication and misunderstanding as possible so that there is the liberty in a church and amongst a group of sinful and fallible people to discuss things that you may not agree on, right? You may not see eye to eye on. But if you can prevent the conflict from happening in the beginning, then that's a lot better than having a conflict that, the, that you then need to resolve because you're not following the principles um, that, that we have laid out in the Bible. Now, there's two things that you need to have liberty to discuss things in a church, right? First thing is you need, you need permission from authority. You know, in the sense that, you know, in, in this church, it needs to be allowed to be talked about. Not everything is allowed to be talked about in church. Obviously, there are certain heresies that aren't allowed here. Um, and if somebody continues to talk about them, continue to promote them, eventually they'll be thrown out. So there's permission from authority. Now, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite liberal in that sense, in the sense that I, I give a lot of freedom for people to talk about things, even though a lot of other churches don't. And, and, I, and there's a reason for that, right? So one, you need permission from authority. But there's a second thing, right? Because it's, it, it, to have an environment in a church where you're free to discuss things, People just think, oh, as long as, as long as the elders, as long as the bishops allow it, then it's like, then it's, that's a great environment. No, no, because there's more to just bishops allowing you to talk about certain topics that make a good environment in a church to talk about things. Because the other thing that you need is you need the responsibility and the charity of the believers in the church so that you, so that you don't destroy the environment that we're trying to create. Does that make sense? So, so I, as a bishop, can say, you know what? You can talk about things like the flat earth. You can talk about, you know, the Trinity controversy. You can talk about all these different things that people want to talk about. But if you don't talk about it in a charitable way, you know, you don't talk about it in the right way, then, then, you'll, then you as well contribute to the destruction of that environment. Why? Because think about when you, have a, when you have a beep with somebody, you don't really want to talk about things anymore. You break that fellowship, right? And that's why it requires conflict resolution. It requires you to resolve things because even though I allow and say, hey, it's fine for people to discuss these things, but you need to discuss it in the right way because you also can destroy. You, you have the power to destroy the fellowship in this church. Not just me. Like I can destroy the, the fellowship in this church by just saying, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about this. If you talk about this, you're not well. You know, that's, that's the way the leaders destroy fellowship in churches, right? But the way church members destroy fellowship is because they don't love one another enough and care about another, one, another, one another enough and don't apply these principles and they destroy that environment, right? So I, I do give a lot of freedom. You know, it's like with government, right? I don't believe in anarchy. You know, like no Christian should be an anarchist, right? We believe in limited government because there is a place for government. And that's how I sort of think of the church. It's like limited government. You know, there's certain things that are not allowed. But other than that, you know, um, we should have liberty here to discuss the Bible, to discuss certain things versus big government philosophy. Like the big government philosophy is like, you know, trying to stamp out everyone's conversation and who you can talk, talk with and you know it's always watching you it's like if i see people talking in the corner it's like oh what are they doing are they talk? you know that's the, i don't want that i don't want that environment here you know i want the environment where it's like okay we can we can talk about things it's okay um because i believe in liberty by by god's definition right just like i believe in love by god's definition liberty doesn't just mean anything goes and that's what libertarian is. You know, when, when you hear the word libertarian in a government philosophy, that, you know, obviously they mean different things by that. Because if you subscribe to libertarianism, which is what is known in the political spectrum, they, they just go by something called the non-aggression principle, which is if you're not hurting somebody else, then it's fine. And that's why libertarians in the po political sphere, because obviously we consider ourselves libertarian, just like we consider ourselves loving. It's just that obviously they sort of hijacked that word to mean you can do whatever you want unless, um, uh, otherwise, uh, unless you're hurting somebody. But that's why they you know, agree with things like abortion, if they believe it's like a woman's right to choose, you know, you take in all the drugs you want, you can fornicate, you can commit homosexuality, you can kill yourself, right? Because you're not hurting anybody else. There's nothing wrong with suicide. Um, and also unconditional free speech, right? The libertarians will say, well, you can't tell me what I can and can't say. Whereas in the Bible, there are things that you can and can't say. Uh, so why do, I, why do I want a church where discussion 
is okay and you have the liberty to talk about things. Here's a few reasons, right? Um, let's go to Amos 3.3. I always think of, when I think of unity, I always think of this verse, right? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Right? And the only way you're going to be agreed is if you can communicate with each other. Right? You can communicate with each other. It's like in any relationship, you have to be able to talk and foster that relationship so that you have unity. Why do we want a strong unity in this church? So that we can walk together. We can walk together preaching the gospel, walk together in the work that this church is doing. We can serve together. Right? So that's why we need a church that has an environment where people can talk to one another, that, we, that, that there is open discussion so that we can work out our differences and we can then walk together because we can get agreed. So you can't have unity in a church without discussion. Right? You can't have, you can't get, how can I get everyone thinking the same when I don't even know what they think? Right? So I need to know what they think, we can talk about it, and then we can persuade one another to, to get on track right? and, and, and believe the right thing. It also, you know, it also breaks down cliques, you know, because if people are willing to talk, if, if people are scared who they can and can't talk to, then they'll just stick with people that they, that they kind of can talk to, as opposed to like talking to everyone in church. So breaking down the cliques. Also, false doctrine surfaces earlier. See, I found that I actually like the fact that people talk about things openly, because if I hear things, I know about it, rather than having an environment where people are scared to talk. It actually helps me, right? Because I hear about what it all is being talked about, um, and if I have to do something about it, I can. Um, I find that there's less spreading of rumors, right? Because just because there's more transparency. Like I, I personally, in my life, I prefer just more transparency, because then there's less things for people to talk about. You know, if I'm a very, some people are very secretive. You know, they don't want anyone knowing anything about them and any of their past. I, I don't think that's a wise thing to do. I understand why people do it. Generally, it's pride, or maybe they're a bit ashamed of things that have happened in the past, or things like that. I, I, I personally think it's a lot easier to live your life a bit more transparent. You know, if you've done wrong in the past, just admit it was wrong. If people know about it, you know, it's no such big deal. People make a big, more, a bigger deal of things when you try and hide it, right? If this Trinity controversy has shown anything, right? It's like people make a bigger deal of things and people don't want to admit that they're wrong. But if they just admit they're wrong, it's like, okay, well, it's, it's over, right? Like, it's not a big deal. So it's, if you live your life that way, you know, you'll be less paranoid about what people think and all this sort of stuff. And are they talking about me when uh, you live a life that's a bit more transparent? And it's like, okay, well, people know that I did that. You know, what's, uh, you know I, I know it was wrong. You know, what's the big deal? Then they move on. Um... And, you know, I don't want a church where people, another reason why I don't want a church where people are fearful to express differing opinions is because when people differ in, op in opinions, it makes things interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, like when things, people differ on things and you're able to talk about it, it to me it makes discussion a lot more interesting yeah. as opposed to just like being in a room where everyone just believes exactly like you do. If you've ever been in that situation, because when I was at Faithful Word Baptist Church, I used to talk with all my mates like all the time. And we were so on board, like so in line with everything that we would go out and eat like after church or whatever. And we'd have nothing to talk about because it's just like, oh, you know, oh, yeah, you agree with me on that thing. So we talk, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like I got nothing to talk about with you guys because, you know, but then when it's like, hey, what do you think about this? And there's a bit of a disagreement. It's like, hey, well, we can, we've got something to talk about, go back and forth about. So I think it makes things a lot more interesting, you know, if, if people have the ability uh, and the charity, you know, the responsibility to be able to talk about these things. But see, at the same time, you know, well, whilst I want all these things, it requires loving communication between believers, right? Because there's two factors here when it comes to communication, like bad communication, right? Because obviously with communication, there's either, you're either talking or you're listening, right? That's, that's what communication is. You're either listening or you're talking. So, in terms of listening, people have to not be offended so easily, right? If you want to be able to talk about things you disagree on, you can't be offended so easily, otherwise you can't have that open environment to talk. Um, and the other thing is the way you talk, right? So we can have peace in this church if we just shut down all conversation, right? Like if I just say, you just can't talk about anything, you know? The only things you can believe and openly talk about are the things that I preach, then you know, we can have peace, right? But then we won't have unity as a church if we can't discuss things and people are actually on board as opposed to... Because what happens in churches where people can't talk 
there's like a false sense of unity. Yeah. Because what happens is their factions start growing within the church and, and they're not known, right? Why do, why do churches get so big and then all of a sudden like this huge group of people just leave? Like, you know, you hear about church. See, in our church, you know, I don't think that's, ha- that's going to happen, right? Because people are free to talk. Maybe they'll expose themselves and they go. So what happens in our church is that the one person comes and one person leaves. The one person <laughs> that, that doesn't agree, right? As opposed to like the one person comes, they know that they have to keep hush-hush and then they, slowly more people come that believe the same. And then all of a sudden there's a church split. But it's just showing that you had peace in that church. You just didn't have unity, right? Because when something actually came up, you know, the light was shown, shown in that darkness. It, re- it makes people realize, hey, we actually believe completely different things, but we never talked about it. You know, we never talked to it for whatever reason. It's not just because people are scared to talk about it. It might just be, you know, having cliques in the church and whatnot. So whilst I want a church where we're free to discuss things, I also don't want unnecessary strife. And that's why I'm saying, you know, we, we, need, we, want, the, we want to have an environment where we foster hey, we we can talk openly about things, we can disagree with one another, but the the only way that's going to work, like I said, is if we have loving communication and we try our best to prevent misunderstanding. We try our best to prevent miscommunication so that we have to take the steps of conflict resolution less often, right? Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So remember two things when we communicate, right? And so let's go through some passages now. Two, th- two things when we communicate. Remember I talked about when you communicate, you're either talking or you're listening. Now, you should really be listening first before you talk, right? We know that from the Bible. But one thing I want to talk about first, the Bible says here, so first thing I want to talk about is how you listen, and then we're going to look at some scriptures about how we talk. So how you listen. It says here, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, first of all, when you're going to listen to somebody, you know, listen to what they say, you don't want to be, like they say today, a snowflake, right? Like the snowflake generation. Why do they call people that just get offended so easily like a snowflake? Why? Because, you know, they say this, the, the generation Y, do they call it generation Z, is like the snowflake generation? Because a snowflake is so beautiful, isn't it? So intricate so unique, you know, so different to everybody else, but the moment you touch it, they just melt, right? And that's, you don't want to be a snowflake Christian, where it's just, you just can't handle anything that's said to you. If something's said to you, you just melt like a snowflake. The Bible says here, if you love, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So obviously a righteous person, you know, doesn't just get offended very easily, right? And if you get offended very easily, it shows a lack of maturity, Right? Because, a lack, because why? Because it takes some maturity to understand why is this person saying this? See, like, like somebody that's immature, when somebody hurls an insult, they're just, they're just going to lash back, right? Because that's, that's what kids do, right? Like kids, if you attack me, I attack you. But a mature person, if, they, if somebody's attacking them, they, they might go, hey, I'm going to seek to understand why does this person feel this way? You know, did I do something? You know, did they take something the wrong way? I mean, obviously, they're, they're acting, they're not just angry for no reason. You know, and they're not just saying this for no reason. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what they're saying. You know, so it takes some maturity not to just so easily get offended. Um, let's go on. So we'll have a look at a couple of verses <clears throat> about how you listen. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, this is James 1.19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, this is a very um, you know, popular passage when it comes to how we are to deal with people, right? Where it says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to, pe- slow to speak, slow to wrath. This is why I'm addressing how you listen first because you should always be a listener first, right? When, if you rush to anything, you should rush to listen, rush to understand, rush to understand why this person is expressing themselves the way they are before you speak. You're slow to speak. Unfortunately, people these days, they are quick to speak quick to wrath, and they are slow to hear, um, as opposed to the Bible saying here, as you are swift, you are quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, one thing I just want to touch on here is, you know, I, I, I get very sus when a lot of, like there are women especially, you know, and I'm stereotyping here, maybe men might do it too, but this whole idea of women's intuition, where, you know, women like, 
they, they just think they know what somebody's thinking just because they're a woman. You know, it's like women that think, oh yeah, they know what baby you're going to have, women's intuition. And it's like, you've got a 50-50 chance, like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, they like, they like people that, that like tell the future, you know, and it's like when you get it wrong, it's like everyone just forgets about it. But when they get it right, oh, it's a big deal. I told you that you were going to have a girl. I told you you were going to have a boy. It's the same with women's intuition. It's like when they get it right, then they're all like, oh, see, I know how to read people. But it's like, you don't, you don't know how to read somebody's mind. Like, like in the passage we read in Joshua 22, only God knows somebody's heart. You have to hear words from somebody to know their heart right so this whole idea of like women's intuition you know you know people have to speak for you to know what they're thinking you're just people people that do that they're just assuming and have you ever heard the saying how do you spell assume yeah. you make an ass out of you and me i don't know if you guys have heard that saying before that's how you spell assume so whenever you're assuming something you you, you could you're going to make an ass out of yourself and that person so what is this getting at? You listen, you're, you're swift to hear. Why? Because you're listening to understand. You're not just waiting for your turn to talk. And now I'm guilty of this too. Right? We're all guilty of this. I'm not preaching this sermon because I'm innocent as well. But, we, we, but that's, that's the idea, right? When, when we talk to somebody, when you're listening, you're listening because you're trying to understand what they're saying, but also why they're saying it, right? Because... That's, that's part of the equation. You don't want to just say what they're saying, but you need to understand why they're saying it because then you understand the motive. You understand the heart behind it. So listen to understand. Don't just wait for your turn to talk. You need to, you need to understand what they're saying not just, and, and why they're saying it, right? Not just what they're saying, but also why they're saying it. And re realize it's, it's not just the words people use when they talk. It's also the meaning behind those words. Because this is what's happening online, right? With the whole Trinity controversy. It's all trigger words. And it's all how people are using these different words, what they mean by these words. And I even preached about that when I preached these three one, that labels are very um, dangerous because people assign different definitions. They use words differently. So then when you're talking to somebody, or you're listening to somebody and you're trying to understand it's not just what they're saying you want to understand why they're saying it you also want to understand what they mean by the words they're saying yeah. right so there's many things that you're trying to be swift to hear before you speak before you actually because it's, it's not that there isn't a time and place to get angry right we're slow to wrath it doesn't say never be never have wrath but we're slow to wrath why because we're swift to hear you don't get immediately offended or angry so if, if you are quick to speak if you find you're a person that's quick to speak quick to wrath it's because you're slow to, to hear you know this is, this is the opposite this is, if you're swift to hear you're going to be slow to speak why because you're hearing but if you're slow to hear or if you're, you're sorry if you're quick to speak and quick to wrath then you're going to be slow to to hear um so so think about these things here's here's let's go through just a couple of proverbs really quick i'll just fly through these Here's some proverbs on listening, right? That I'm sure many of us are familiar with. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Right? So we need to hear and, uh, and understand it before we answer it, right? Before we, it's, again, it's the same principle. Otherwise, it's folly and shame unto you. You look like a fool, right? If you do that. Proverbs, oh, sorry, it's the next passage now. What did you see here? Verse 15. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh wisdom. Interesting. So I just thought that went with you know, being you know, quick to hear, swift to hear, right? That the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. The ear of the wise is not just listening. He's listening to understand, to, to learn something, right? Let's go to Proverbs 10, 19. Look at this. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Why? Why is it wise to sometimes refrain your lips? Because you're swift to hear. You're listening first, right? Um, to in, before you speak, before you then go on to say a multitude of words. Proverbs 26. Look at a few others. I looked up the phrase because I knew that there was this phrase in the Bible that says, there is more hope of a fool than of him. And I found it twice in Proverbs. And it's just interesting that they're kind of linked, right? So one here is in Proverbs, they're both in the same proverb. Um, no, no, sorry, this is in Proverbs 26, the, in, the other is in Proverbs 29. 
It says here, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. So the Bible is saying here that a foolish person has more hope. He's, he's going to look better because he's wiser here than somebody who thinks they know everything. Right? If you're wise in your own conceit. Why? Because you're not willing to understand or learn anything new. He's saying at least a fool, even though he's foolish, is able to learn some things right? more than somebody who cannot learn anything. So again, this is somebody that's not listening. Uh, um, Proverbs 29, 20. Look at this. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words. So you see how it's the same, it's, it's like on the other side, it's like a person that's not swift to hear, he's not listening, he's, he's, he's wise in his own conceit. And then there's a man that's hasty in his words, right? He's quick to speak, uh, swift, quick to speak, uh, uh, quick, so, slow to, not slow to speak, not slow to rub. There is more hope of a fool than of him. So I just thought it was interesting that there's two Proverbs in different chapters that have that same phrase, and they're kind of interlinked to somebody that speaks, does, speaks quickly and doesn't listen properly. So that's how you listen. How you listen. A few principles there. Let's go on to how you talk. How you talk. Now, a lot of people in the fundamental Baptist, you know, independent churches, you know, fundamental churches, we're all about the truth, right? You know, the preaching is all the hey, speaking the truth. And sometimes we go a bit too far in the sense that people ha get, start getting this mentality, you know, and even in their preaching, right? That I just speak the truth and it doesn't matter how I speak the truth. You just, got, you just deal with it. I just speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Now, this is not biblical Christianity. This is not the, what the Bible teaches at all. We never just speak things with, with total disregard for you know, how it might be received, how we are coming across the heart in which we say it. There, there is, you know, we don't just speak the truth without any sort of consideration for those things. Now, that's not to say you don't speak the truth, right? We speak the truth. The Bible says here, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And, you know, this sermon won't even scratch the surface of communication, right? Because all, all through the Bible, like, I mean, all through Proverbs, I mean, Proverbs 18, if you read that, it's just all about communication, words, foolish talk. I mean, I'm just going to go to a couple of passages here, but there are all sorts of passages throughout the Bible on the tongue and how you're meant to speak. You know, if, if it was just as simple as just telling the truth with disregard, I mean, why, why is there so much warnings about how we are meant to communicate? how we are meant to say things. So here's one where it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So it's speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Colossians 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, a lot of people get this the other way, right, right, other way, right, other way around, where they say, they think, let your speech be always with salt, seasoned with grace, right? Because they're just like, the truth, the truth, and, you know, and they'll fall, oh, sorry, I said that, you know, it's a, bit, it's a little bit of grace I'm throwing in there, right? No, it says, your speech should always be grace, seasoned with salt, right? So grace is like that love part. See, salt is the truth. But it, notice how it says it's seasoned with salt. And it's likening your communication with food. So think of it that way. When I talk to somebody, I'm dishing them something to eat. And if you, those of you that like cooking, you know, you only got to put a little bit of that stuff to make it taste good. If you put too much of it, you're going to destroy that meal. And they're not going to eat it. They're not going to like eating it. You got to think of the same. When I talk, when I speak to people, I'm preparing this meal. I want them to like it. I want them to, I want them to receive that, right? So this is how you got to think when, when you're talking with people, right? Let your grace be always, let your, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. Right? This is the way in which we talk. So, how do you make it tasty? How do you make your communication tasty so that people will receive it? This is the things we've got to consider, right, when we, when we talk. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Look at this. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, I always think of this passage whenever I'm arguing with somebody or somebody's angry at me. This, this proverb always comes to mind because I think if somebody's going to like fully get on me, soft answer turns away wrath. But if somebody's up in your face, right, up or up in your grill, you know, you don't just like go back, right? Because what does it say? It says, but grievous words stir up anger. So if you fight back with grievous words, 
you're not resolving that situation. A soft answer turns away wrath. You want to calm them down so that you, because you're trying to serve something tasty to them, right? So, you know, you, you, they, they're saying to you, hey, your dish is too salty. That's what kind of like what they say. You know, just dish them more salt, right? And say like, hey, you know. So think about how you talk. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. See, there's a right way to use knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour, poureth out foolishness. See, so words, words are not only offensive, they can be offensive. They can be defensive as well. Like here, you know, they're going to say in soccer, you know, good, what is it, good defense, a good offense. There's a good defense, right? Same with words, right? A good offense is a good defense, right? The way you use your words, you can, you can, you can diffuse the situation. Uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 24. Look at this. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So if we compare this to Colossians 4, what is God here saying to servants of the Lord? He's saying, hey, when you, you're dishing up food, dish up some tasty food. Right? Don't dish up food that's too salty um, because people are not going to receive that as well. Um, so it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. But I'll add this as well, right? It's, it's the body language as well. Right, your body speaks as well. So your body language should follow similar principles, right? So, you know, maybe if you're somebody that's really tall, you know, step back a bit from the person rather than like, you know, just getting closer and towering over them. Or, you know, it, 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 it's, I don't know all the different, you know, techniques for body language and whatnot, but, you know, just, it's just all I'm, say, all I'm preaching here is I'm just getting you to consider things, right? The Bible is very clear that we need to consider how we listen, how we talk. Um, one more I want to show here before I just go on to another topic. Matthew 18, 15. This is the conflict resolution passage. Um, I'm not going to read all three verses because it's, I'm not really talking about conflict resolution. But verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. One thing I just want to gather from this is if you're talking to somebody, maybe if it's a touchy topic, you need to consider the audience that you have, right? Because here it's obviously a touchy topic. You know, somebody's offended somebody, they're going to try correct them or going to go talk to them. So you, you may not want to do that. Like, you, you know, if they're talking within a group and you're like, hey, well, the Bible says I'm going to go up to them and correct them, you just go up and there's just people there. There's a reason why, you know, you go alone because if you want to resolve something that might be a little bit touchy, you might want to talk it through, you know, talk it through privately first. So these are some things you want to think about, you know, how you talk, how you listen, you know, what you say, um, the way you say it, your body language, the environment. You know, and that's why when, when sometimes there's conflict, you know, and there's people standing around, I'll say like, you know, these people have to go away, right? Because if, they, if they're just there listening, people tend to get more defensive. People tend to um, have more pride when there is an audience. And that's why it's not always fruitful to discuss things when there's a lot of people present. And, you know, I find that the same in my workplace as well. You know, like, the people operate differently, obviously, and, and I'm not saying one is better than another. I've just found it's a lot more fruitful in my line of work to meet with people privately because what I found is everyone wants to have these efficient meetings where everyone gets in a room, right? And they, they say, oh, it's more efficient because everyone's there, everyone can talk, and, you know, and then everyone's on the same page. That's fine, I feel, if you're just getting an update. Kind of like here, right? Like, this is not really a dialogue. You know, you're, I'm preaching, just I'm, I'm saying some things to go, try and get us all on the same page. That's when it's fine. That's when you want everyone in the room. But when, when you want people to go back and forth, right, and people might disagree, you may not want everybody in the same room. And this is what I've found in my workplace is that it's just easier sometimes if I just go and, and approach different people, get all the facts, then get them in a room and then tell them what's happening. Because when you try and get them in a room, you know, you know, you know this person thinks something, but they're not willing to say it. Why? Because they're, they're, they're proud or they're shy, you know? And it's the same in church. It's the same just in any relationship, right? So sometimes taking it, they say, offline, away from everyone, you'll get a bit further. So these are some things to, to think about. Now, just on this topic of, you know, words, right? And, and, and we already talked about that the Bible is very clear that when we speak, 
you know, we need to consider how we come across, how it's received. But what I want to just talk about right now is, you know, I really want you to internalize the danger of words, you know, because, you know, people will say things like, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Sticks and stones will break, they're saying basically like, you can physically hurt me, but whatever you call me, whatever you say to me, you know, what they say, boing flick? <laughs> I don't know where that's from, I heard it somewhere. I think it's from a movie, <laughs> showing, my, showing my worldly side. So, I remember there was this like boy and flick or whatever. So it's like this whole idea of like, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Now, if you look through the Bible, you're familiar with the Bible, this is the complete opposite, right, of what God tells us. That, that words, they do hurt, right? And in fact, words can do more damage than physical hurt. Right? So this idea that physical hurt and the names, it's therefore, it's okay if I say something, but I just, I didn't harm them physically. No, because your words can do more damage to somebody than even physical harm. And I, when I was looking at this topic, it's, it's interesting. I came across this, this proverb. And I just find it so interesting. Look at this. It says here, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear you know what that's saying? That's saying that if somebody's sick, but if they have the right attitude, the right spirit, it'll, it'll bring them through that. But it's saying if, if you destroy their spirit though, nothing can bring them through, you know, because it's, it's like if, 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 the, if the spirit is wounded, then it's like nothing can make them feel better, right? So isn't that interesting? Because this is saying that even if you are physically sick, you are physically harmed, if you have the right spirit, you can get through it. But if you don't have the right spirit, I mean, even the smallest thing, you know, might crush you. So how do you, how do you wound, how do you wound a spirit, right? 412, I think we already know, but I'll just show you from the Bible. Look at this, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow is in a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So just like the word of God is quick and powerful and goes all the way into the spirit, all the way into the soul, divides the soul and spirit, it's the same with our words. Our words are very powerful, right? Our words go, and, and this is how, if you want to attack somebody's spirit, how do you do it? Because you can't attack their spirit physically, right? It's like in, the, in, the, in Acts, right? They tried to attack their spirit physically, but they, they were joyful that they count, were counted worthy to suffer um, shame for his name. But the way you do it is through words, right? The words is what, what gets to people's spirit. So that's how you wound things. That's why, you know, Jesus said in John 6, 63, you know, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Because the words, just like they speak to the soul, they speak to the spirit, bad words wound the spirit. They hurt the spirit. They hurt the soul. Um, and I won't go to all these passages, but I just thought it's interesting that this, uh, this thing here, like when we look at the armor of God, you know, our, we, all, the, all the elements of the armor of God are defensive, but then you get to the offensive, our weapon, the sword of the spirit. What is that? Which is the word of God. See how we're in a spiritual battle? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And our battle is a spiritual battle. Why? Because it's a battle of words, right? It's a battle of words. That's why Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And it's interesting here that it says, the sword of the spirit which is the Word of God. So we see here the three being one, right? Where it wrenches the Spirit and it's the Word and, and the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, right? So, what else? Let's go here to 2 Corinthians to show you some more examples of just words being powerful. Look at here, the Apostles, where Paul says, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. See, so Paul was given authority so that he could say things and he could either destroy something or he could edify something. Um, very famous one in James. James is talking about the tongue. I, I won't read all of it, but I'll just point out some passages here. He says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Why? For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So he's saying here, hey, we need to think about 
when we do things publicly, when we teach, it's very important that we consider the things we say. Why? Because we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. Why? From the things that we say, the things that we teach. That's why it says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Then it goes on to say, controlling horses and ships. Look at this. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, of, uh, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. So this idea that words have no power, that you know, sticks and stones break my bones, but names will never hurt me. This is saying the tongue is like a little fire that can kindle this great fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Proverbs 18, 21. Uh, 18, sorry. Proverbs 18, 21. Look at this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So what I'm, trying, what I'm just trying to emphasize here is that you, know, you, you need to really be careful the words you speak. You need to take some responsibility for the things you speak and realize the power of words, the power that words have to bring life, but also the power words have to destroy life, right? The power words have to destroy somebody's spirit, right? And this is why it's so important that we you know, try our best to tame our tongue. Now, in the context of, um, <clears throat> talk, you know, because we talked about having this sort of liberty to talk amongst our church, right, to talk to each other. Um, why is it so important? Because look at what it says. This is Proverbs 18. So you can go back and read all of Proverbs 18, but a lot of it is about, you know, miscommunication, you know, misunderstanding, talking, right, and the tongue. Look at this, as a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So this is one reason why we want to be careful how we speak. Remember how we talked about it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and it's the same. You know, it's a lot easier to have a good relationship with a brother from the beginning than to have to try and resolve a conflict right after the fact, because it's very hard to win somebody over once you've offended them than it is to start from the other side, right? And slowly build up and then build up to offensive topics as opposed to the other way around. Um, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10, look at what Paul says here, to whom he, ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest sa Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now let that, let that sink down into your ears in the sense that, you know, this is how Satan works. This is how Satan works to divide churches. This is how Satan works to divide fellowship between believers. This is how Satan, you know, gets believers ineffective, right? Because they're, they're bickering and they're fighting with one another. And he's saying here, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices because if you get caught up in some sort of conflict with your brother in Christ and it's making you ineffective, it's destroying fellowship, Satan is working in that situation, right? Because this is what Satan does. This is his device. We, are not, we don't want to be ignorant of how he works. And how does he work? He works when we are biting and devouring one another. And that's the passage I want to end on because I feel like it really sums up well what the point I'm trying to get across here is like, I want the liberty in our church to discuss things that we disagree on. But if we have this liberty, then we need, first of all, like I said, you have authority from the leaders, because I, that's why I don't, I don't mind. I have limited government in this church. But you're, you have to take the responsibility to think about how you listen, how you talk, you know, how you deal with people, know the power that words have so that you use that liberty correctly. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So in conclusion, you know, if we want a spirit of liberty, like I said, and unity in this church, we, we are going to need to communicate. Right? There needs to be talking going on so that we can get on the same page and we can you know, actually truly have unity rather than just peace. And we need to consider how we listen, how we speak, so that we prevent misunderstanding, 
you know, miscommunication and conflict and, and really think about the, the, the damage that your words can do if, you are not, if, you, if you're not uh, swift to hear, slow to speak. And, and the last thing I want to say is this, is make sure that you're applying this sermon to yourself. Right? Because we've all, all of us have situations. I, I'm sure, you know, I may not know all your situations, but I'm sure you all have situations where you have conflict with people, right? It's not just conflicts that you may know about, right? I'm sure in your own personal life, you know, you have conflicts that, you know, you don't get along with this person, right? It might be at work, it might be in church, it might be, you know, a family member or whatnot, right? So I want to make sure that when you hear sermons like this, that you apply the biblical principles first to yourself, right? You don't hear a sermon like this and go, yeah, that person needs to think about how they talk and that person needs to think about how they listen because they're not listening to me and you know they're not getting what i'm saying well you know I, yeah maybe you know i'm not justifying that person but like i said when you hear preaching like this you need to apply it first to yourself and then when you have the right spirit you have the right frame of mind then you're ready right slow to speak now you're ready to speak right because you're swift to hear swift to understand you have the right spirit now you're slow to speak slow to wrath all right let's pray Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, there's so much uh, direction, Lord, and so much rebuke in, this, in these passages, Lord, even to myself. Like, you know, we all struggle, uh, especially those of us who, you know, who speak a lot uh, for a living, um, you know, and, and maybe we're a bit more witty than others. Um, we, pray, um, we just pray, Lord, that you help us to have grace um, in our speech and seasoned with salt. Help us to be swift to hear, slow to speak. Help us, Lord, to not be offended easily at what people say. Help us, Lord, as we, as we listen, that we listen to understand what they are trying to tell us, why they're trying to say these things, Lord, and that therefore we are slow to speak and slow to wrath. Help us, Lord. We need your grace. You know, we are but sinners, Lord. Forgive us and help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus every day. Uh, and we pray all these things in his glorious name. Amen. Okay, so uh, I'll just sing one more song and then um, we can spend some time talking and put these principles into practice. All right, okay. Take the name of Jesus with you.